morning, dear guests from the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities, dear Mr. President, dear Mr. President, uh, on behalf of the first section, the section of linguistics and literary scholarship uh, of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, I kindly welcome everybody in the ceremonial hall of the Palace of the Academy and everywhere in the world in front of their computers in the centennial commemoration on the passing of Ignaz Goldziher. May I now first kindly ask Professor Tamás Frank, the President of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, to open the commemorational event. Dear guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you at the opening session of the centennial commemoration of the death of Ignaz Goldziher. This session is one of the numerous events that will take place in the following days in Hungary to remember one of the greatest scholars of Islamic studies in Europe. I am truly thankful for the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, and in particular, Professor Johannan Friedman, for the initiative which allowed us to connect our work. It is indeed most appropriate that the commemorative events were organized jointly by Israeli and Hungarian scholars, both academies, the Avicenna Institute of Middle Eastern Studies, and the library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. I would like to express my deep appreciation for the members of the Israeli delegation who, despite of the fourth wave of the COVID pandemic, are all here in person for this important mission, all but one. It is with great sorrow that I have learned about the recent passing of Professor Shaul Shekid, whose presence in, is sorely missed here, not only as a world-renowned scholar of religious and Iranian studies, but also as a member of both our academies. May I take this opportunity to express my most sincere condolences for his family and colleagues in the name of the entire Hungarian scientific community. I'm sure his outstanding work and personality will be remembered by his colleagues who are with us today. It is indeed most fitting that we, were, uh, we commemorate the 100th anniversary of Ignaz Gotzier's passing within the walls of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. The Academy has recognized his extraordinary talent from the very early age by electing him corresponding member at the age of 26 in 1876, and ordinary member at the age of 42. Ignaz Goldziher was a very active member of his learned society, accepting the presidency of Section 1, that of linguistics and literary scholarship in 1905, and becoming a member of the board of directors in 1911. It was from the entrance hall of this building that after the eulogy by the Secretary General, his funeral procession started to accompany him on his final journey. Today, when we remember the centenary of Ignaz Gotzier's death, we remember a scholar who is regarded as one of the founders, if not the founder, of Islamic studies in Europe. There is no need to emphasize the importance of these studies in our contemporary society, where the mutual understanding in cross-cultural communication and interfaith dialogue are of crucial significance. As a scholar, Gotzi had worked at the crossroads of the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He was born into Judaism and throughout his life remoted, remained devoted to his faith. Nevertheless, He was of such a tolerant predisposition that he managed to combine the methodologies of Protestant Bible criticism to the study of his chosen field, Islam. By the application of this method to Islamic studies, Islamic traditions, Gozier not only laid the foundations of Islamic studies as a modern academic discipline, but also changed our understanding of Islamic history. He was deeply knowledgeable about comparative theory of religions and developed his own views on their evolutionary history, which he applied to Judaism and Islam alike. He strongly believed in the transformative power of critical scholarship. Goldsier had 
always shown a true interest towards the cultural history of Middle Eastern people in its broadest sense, and he was open-minded concerning the latest developments in these societies. It should be emphasized that he was in very good terms with several prominent intellectuals in the region. His interest was extremely diversified, and although his study focused on medieval Islam, he was sensitive to new religious movements as well. As it is well attested by his correspondence, amounting to over 13,000 items kept today in the Oriental Collection of our library, he was an extremely active member of the international scholarly community, attending conferences in Oriental studies and comparative religion. In the field of Arabic studies, he was a linguist, a historian, and a scholar of literature, while the scope of his interest in Islamic studies extended from Islamic law to encompass prophetic traditions, Quranic exegesis, and popular religion. He was not only the greatest scholar of Islam in his age, but his influence is being felt even today, when his books and articles are still being republished and translated to several languages. His opinions are not only quoted, but are extensively discussed all over the world, even today. I have no doubt that today's lectures and exhibition, soon to be opened, will also extend our understanding of Gautier's extraordinary achievements and the state of Islamic studies today. Let me thank once again to all who have invested so much work into this rich centennial commemorative program, among others, Pál Esvarga, the chair of our organizing committee, Miklós Marót, Vanda Lam, István Monok, and Agnes Kelecsényi, and I wish you a successful conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Freund, for your opening speech and for your commemoration of the late Professor Shakid, who should have been one of the keynote speakers of the conference. In the second part, we will listen to three memorial lectures to Ignaz Goldziger. May I kindly ask Professor Miklos Marut, member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, the president of the Ötvös Lorant Research Network, the director of the Avicenna Institute of Middle Eastern Studies in Pilis Java, to give his memorial lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Goldseer Ignaz died 100 years and two days ago. His biographers uh, have already said everything worthwhile, so I, uh, in the next uh, few minutes, I would like to highlight just one aspect of his activity that has not been emphasized enough so far. In 1855, the conservative Austrian count Thun Leo carried out an educational reform in Hungary. In terms of university education, this meant eliminating the traditional humanities faculty that served as a propedeutic course for university studies, taking it down to the sixth class grammar school, increasing the number of classes from six to eight. Instead, a new humanities faculty was established, modeled on the German universities where students could already gain their qualification in various fields to become specialized in secondary school teachers. Hungarian universities were looking for appropriate teachers, mainly from Germany, and talented young people from Hungary. Ignaz Goldziher became famous for gaining considerable knowledge in the traditional Jewish sciences as a child, despite his young age. Still, in primary school, he read the most important works of the, uh, of the Jewish sciences in Hebrew, including the books of Maimonides and Yehuda Halevi. Minister of Education, Josef Ötvös, singled him out for the task of founding Oriental Studies in Hungary. He completed his last three years of the grammar school in Pest. In parallel with his grammar school studies, he also attended the classes of the new Faculty of Arts, 
uh, mainly in the field of classical philology. And at the Roman Catholic Seminary, he began uh, studying Arabic with the professor of biblical studies named Janos Miklos Ruzicka, who was a Benedictine monk. After graduating from grammar school, he went to study in Germany, where he studied with the best scholars of the Arabic and Semitic philology of his time in Berlin and Leipzig. His interest turned to Islam. He held that he was a scholar of the history of Arabic and Jewish philosophy. This was his opinion. However, the world remembers him as one of the greatest authorities in the Muslim tradition, the Hadith literature. In fact, he achieved significant results in both areas because his early knowledge and understanding of Jewish sciences immensely helped him to understand Arabic sources better and more intensely than others. He brought his knowledge acquired in the best foreign universities of his time to the young Hungarian university, supplemented by his own genius and the knowledge of the traditional Jewish scholarship. Through his work, a few decades after its foundation, the University of Budapest was able to become a central place in the international scientific life, if not in its entirety, but at least in a small part. Through his scientific activity, various fields of knowledge far apart were united in one person and brought a remarkable unique result. At the same time, it is a sad duty to commemorate the death of a, uh, one of the invited speakers at our current conference. Shaul Shaked, who was initially scheduled to start reading his paper in a few minutes, was born in Debrecen in 1933 and lived in Israel with his parents from 1934. In 1955, at the age of 22, he received a BA in Arabic and Semitic Philology from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and in 60, an MA in Arabic and Comparative Religion. In London, uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies awarded his PhD in uh, uh, 1964 at the age of 31 in Iranian philology. Summarizing his work and achievements in a few minutes, one can arrange the material along four axes following the most important areas of uh, research he has identified in his biography. One axis is Middle and New Iranian philology. The focus of his research was on Zoroastrianism in linguistic and religious, uh, religious aspects. He highlighted three areas. Uh, on the one hand, uh, they meant an in-depth examination of the relevant text corpora, for example, the Pehlavili comments of uh, Avesta. We must single out uh, the creation of the Middle Persian Dictionary, a huge computer database that processes the linguistic material of Middle Persian sources. The Semitic philology research can be arranged around the second axis. The results of his research are contained in a good number of thick, uh, sometimes one, sometimes several authors' books, in which one can read inscriptions with magical contact, mainly in Aramaic, uh, but sometimes in Hebrew and Syriac. Uh, the books with magic inscriptions, which are uh, already difficult to read, were spread over a large geographical area and contained many linguistically and religious, religious curiosities. Thanks to the activities of Shaul Shaked, the vast corpus of texts preserved in various languages and objects are easily accessible to anyone today. The third axis is the study of early Jewish Persian language and literature. The use of Middle Persian language gradually receded in favor of the new Persian after the 7th century Arab conquest and uh, the spread of Islam. The most important corpus of the transitional period is the group of Hebrew written Jewish monuments reflecting the spoken Persian language of that time. Of course, the written text also indirectly shed some light on uh, other, uh, other conditions in the region, uh, thus significantly expanding our knowledge of Iranian territory, complementing the Arabic sources. This multifaceted research work, which presupposes knowledge of Persian, Arabic, and other Semitic languages, was preceded by research into the Cairo Geniza, and this is the fourth axis. The Geniza, which Shandor Scheiber also researched, is an independent group, group of sources. However, Shaul Shaked, with his interest in these texts, explained, for example, the magic texts, 
processed a hither, hitherto unknown record in the Iranian dialect and many other problems. With his diverse, deep knowledge, Shaul Shaket has gained great esteem for, for Israeli science worldwide. However, he never forgot his native country. As the vice president of the Association of European Iranists, he considered uh, it important to nominate a Hungarian scientist as his successor when he resigned. As the former president of the Union Academic International, he supported the Hungarian Academy of Sciences a re representative from among the candidates to succeed him. While visiting Budapest, he never failed to give lectures to Hungarian students at the Department of Iranian Studies at the Otto Schlorant University. In recognition of his commitment to Hungary and uh, as citizen of Hungary, or of the country, he was elected member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in the category Hungarians Beyond the Border. His death is a great loss for the Academy of Sciences in Israel and also for our Academy of Sciences. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Marut, for your commemorable speech, both about Igaz Goldziher and Professor Shaul Shaked. Now, may I ask Professor Johanan Friedman, member of the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities, who is a professor emeritus in, of the Institute of Asian and African Studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel, to deliver his memorial lecture with the title of Goldziher's reception in the Arab world. Thank you. Good morning. Let me first of all express my gratitude to President Freund, Professor Vargo, the Major Tudományos Akademio, and to Professor Morot, Director of the Avicenna Institute, for initiating this significant event and for inviting me and my colleague, Professor Loverbrein, to participate. Thanks are also due to Ms. Kathleen Fodor and Ms. Nicoletta Forogo for efficiently taking care of administrative matters. May I begin on a personal note? I may be the only person in this gathering who can say that his father studied with Goldseer. Indeed, my father, Moshe Moritz Friedman, studied with our honoree at the Robbie Cape so Intezet during the First World War. When I started my studies at the Hebrew University in 1956 and brought home the Hebrew translation of the Vorlesungen, he told me the story. His relationship with his master was not quite happy. My father absented himself from many Arabic classes given by Goldseer, preferred to go to the silent films, which were the big attraction in those days, and Goldseer refused to give him credit for the course. This may have been the reason why my father left his rabbinical studies and went to study medicine in Prague. In the list of students of the Intezet for 1917-1918, there is an asterisk next to my father's name. And the meaning of the asterisk, as explained uh, after the list, is Ozon Tonulog, Kiknek Neve, Chilogol von Jelulve, Oz Ishkolo Ev Kösben, Elmarotok. So he was more or less expelled from the rabbinical uh, seminary because he didn't uh, attend the Arabic classes properly. But I think that I have fully atoned for, my, for the sins of my father by studying Arabic and Islam since my childhood more than 70 years now. Now speaking about Goldseer in Budapest, in the presence of Hungarian scholars of Islam, and especially Professor Robert Shimon, who wrote substantial analyses and appreciations of Goldseer's work, 
reminds me of the pre-Islamic poet Antara ibn Ash-Shaddad, who begins his famous Mu'allaka Ode with the uh, following line, Hal ghadara shu'ara umin mutaraddami. Have the poets left anything to patch up? This is to say, does he have anything new to say? His doubts notwithstanding, Antara ibn Ashadad went ahead to compose his oath. So I, following, I am following his lead and I am going ahead uh, with my remarks also. My presentation deals with the reception of Goldseer's work in the Arab world. And I shall uh, do this mainly on the basis of uh, the Arabic translations of the Vorlesungen, the Arabic translations of the Richtungen, and a recent Arabic translation of the Tagebuch, which was published in Cairo in 2016. And last Saturday, I heard on the Internet Symposium about Goldseer and his uh, correspondence that the Mohammedanish Studien is also going to be translated into Arabic by an Egyptian scholar. Now we should distinguish between two main approaches in Goldseer's work to Goldseer's work in the Arab world, mainly in Egypt. One approach is prominent in works dedicated to the struggle against Orientalism. This approach denounces Goldseer for being part of the imperialist and missionary project designed to destroy Islam. Now, it is a bit difficult, of course, to accuse Goldseer of being part of a Christian missionary project, but we shouldn't be disturbed by such inconvenient facts. The language employed by the proponents of this approach is frequently rude and goes way beyond the norms of scholarly discourse and we should see this attitude in the context of the widespread criticism of the non-Muslim scholars of Islam, whose researches have been frequently described as intellectual aggression, al-Ghazu al-Fikri, even before Edward Said wrote his Orientalism. I think that much more interesting and significant is the approach of scholars who criticize Goldseer in a very different style. They take him to task for treating the Quran as if it were the creation of the Prophet Muhammad and for treating the Hadith with methods of historical criticism. But nevertheless, they found it advisable to translate the three major works of Goldseer into Arabic and included in their introductions highly positive remarks about Goldseer's work. This is indicative of the appreciation of Goldseer's work in the scholarly circles of um, the Arab world, mainly in uh, Egypt, mainly in uh, Egypt. The translation, um, the translators of the Vorlesungen uh, appended to their translation dozens of critical notes which accused Goldseer of attempting to undermine the truth, quote unquote, the truth of Islam, mainly because he spoke about foreign influences in Islamic, on Islamic beliefs and thus cast doubts on the divine origin of the Quran. You see, if you speak about foreign influences on the Quran, it is as if you said that there are foreign influences on God himself. On the other hand, the introductions to these works include words of praise for Goldseer's, um, um, and I shall give some examples of both praise and criticism in what follows. In any case, the image of Goldseer in the Arab world is complex and is not exclusively negative, as has sometimes been said. Now, the translation of the Vorlesungen was first published in 1946, reprinted in Cairo in 1959, and published again in 2009 by uh, Manshur Atul Jamal, which is a Lebanese uh, publisher, but it has a branch in Germany under the name Al Kamel Verlag. Now, the 1959 edition lists three translators 
but the leading one seems to have been Mohammad Yusuf Musa, an Azhar scholar who studied French and held a doctorate in philosophy from the Sorbonne. The translation was done from the French version of the Vorlesungen by Félix Arin, Le Dogme et la Loi de l'Islam. Now, in their introduction, in their introduction, the translators praised Goldseer for his brilliant intelligence and penetrating insights and assert that the translated book will be a treasure grove for the Arabic reading public. But they also maintain that Goldseer committed serious errors. It is interesting to know that the praise is in the introduction and the criticism is uh, usually in notes appended to the translation. Now, they attribute these errors to the natural inclination of people to identify strongly with their own religion and consequently to find fault with the religions of others. The criticism of Goldseer's ideas is rooted in the classical Muslim perception of the nature of Islam as a religion revealed to the Prophet Muhammad in its perfect form. Now, Goldseer says in the first chapter of the Vorlesungen that he will analyze the factors which contributed to the historical evolution of Islam, and that, and I quote, and you have it as the first passage in your handout. Um, um, he says in the Vorlesungen, Islam as it appears in its nature, in its mature aspects, is the product of various influences that had affected its development and as an ethical worldview and as a system of law and dogma before it reached its definitive orthodox form. Now, this is, of course, the approach which is expected of a historian of religions, which are undoubtedly influenced by each other in a myriad of ways. But the Arab translator takes Goldseer to task because, and I will, you have this passage in, uh, this passage number two of my handout, uh, in Lam Yuwafik Mabadia Mabadia Mabadiahu Fa in al Muslimin Yan Bidunahu Wayah Jurunahu and there is an English translation on the handout uh, also. Now um, what does what does all this mean? The I understand quite well why the Arab translator uh, takes Goldseer to task for treating Islam as any other belief system, because in his view, Islam was perfect when it was first revealed. Why does he think so? Because there is a Quranic verse which says so. Al yawm akmaltu lakum dinakum. Today, I have perfected your religion for you, says God in the Quran. Wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, and I gave you all my um, graces, waraditu lakumul Islam adinan, and I approved Islam uh, to be your uh, religion. Therefore, there is no place for further development. And the translator also criticizes Goldseer for saying that Muhammad did not proclaim new ideas. This is a sentence from uh, the, the first chapter of the Vorlesungen. He did not enrich earlier conceptions of man's relations to the transcendent and the infinite." End of quote. Now, Goldseer, of course, meant to say that the monotheism of Islam is not new, but the translator took it to mean that Muhammad did not bring anything new to the inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula. 
In order to refute this, he gives a list of reforms which Muhammad introduced into the lives of Arabs who had been polytheists engaged in false beliefs and rituals. Such criticals, critical remarks of the translator can easily be multiplied. Incidentally, Goldseer would be the first to admit that Muhammad was introduced very substantial reforms, both religious and social, in the Arabian Peninsula, and he explicitly says in the Vorlesungen that uh, Muhammad was the first and the most significant reformer among the uh, Arabs. Let us now move to the translation of the Richtungen. The first partial translation by the Egyptian scholar Ali um, Abdul Qadir Ali Abdul Qadir um, was published in 1944. It includes only the first three chapters of the book because the translator was summoned to work for an Islamic institute in London before he completed his work. The translator had held a doctorate from a university in Berlin, but I couldn't find out from which one, neither do I know when he studied in Berlin. In contradistinction to the Vorlesungen, this translation must have been done from the German original. The translator says in the introduction that he embarked on the translation as a result of a 1942 decision by Al-Azhar to translate some important Western books into Arabic in order to introduce, I quote, a new element in research methods in Islamic sciences, philosophy, and history. A translation of the whole book of the Richtungen was published in Cairo in 1955. The translator, Abdul Halim al Najjar, who was a professor at Cairo University and died in 1964, mentions in his introduction various deficiencies in Goldseer's work, such as the lack of discussion of legal exegesis of the Quran, but hastens to assert that these deficiencies do not decrease the value of the book, which is, and I quote, a work originally in method and research style, novel in the presentation of Quranic studies and of the history of Islamic civilization in, what, in one of its most important aspects. Hamalun Muptakir, min haythul manhaj wa uslub al-bahs, tarif fi ard, now, despite this appreciation of Goldseer's work, Annachar appended to his translation a substantial number of critical notes in places where Goldseer expressed opinions which, in Annachar's view, belittled the Quran, did not do justice to Islam or gave legitimacy to views um, which deviate from the uh, classical sunnah. By way of example, I would like to mention the following. When Goldseer mentions Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 54, in which Moses instructs the children of Israel to kill themselves, faktulu anfusakum, says the Quran, because of the golden calf episodes, and says that it is related to Genesis 32, verse 27, in which Moses instructs the Levites that everyone, I quote, should kill his brother, companion, or neighbor, hirgu ishet achiv, ve ishet re'ehu, ve ishet krovo. The translator says that Goldseer is fabricating lies against the Quran. Because all heavenly books, such as the Torah and the Quran, originate in the preserved table. There is a Quranic verse which says so, that the Quran is preserved in a preserved table. That, this being the case, similarities between the revealed books do not result from mutual influence, but rather from a common divine source. This is an attempt to undermine the historical approach represented by Goldseer in order to substantiate the classical perception of Islam as a religion which was perfect immediately after its revelation, therefore did not need to develop 
and was not influenced by other religions and civilizations. Now, the introduction to the Arabic translation of the Tagebuch, published in 2016, is characterized by a similar approach. The translator, Muhammad Auni Abdul Rauf, received his doctorate in Semitistic from the University of Göttingen under the supervision of Albert Dietrich. The introduction to the translation tells the story of the Tab Tagebuch in an appreciative tone, repeating the ideas and even the expressions included in the much earlier translation of the Vorlesungen. Uh, Abdul Rauf praises Goldseer for his brilliance, his penetrating insights, and the exactitude with which he perused his sources. It is noteworthy that he included in the introduction quotations of the passages in which Goldseer expressed his appreciation and sympathy with Islam. On the other hand, he, re he resembles the translators of the Vorlesungen and of the Richtungen in rejecting the idea of influences between religions and argues that any similarities between the three heavenly religions, this is to say Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, are the result of a common source, the preserved table, rather than from mutual influence on earth. Incidentally, I did not see in the standard classical exegesis of the Quran, the idea that the Torah or the New Testament are included in the preserved table, Allah al Mahfuz, mentioned in the 88th surahs, surah of the Quran. And I think I should investigate this further because usually uh, traditional scholars of Islam do not invent new, um, ex new exegesis of such things. And maybe I have missed some um, commentary in which this idea uh, can be found. Now, uh, critical remarks of this kind uh, are included in uh, the work of scholars who invest a tremendous amount of work in order to place the two major books of Goldseer and his diary in the hands of the Arab reading public. The initiative to translate these works is, in my view, much more important than the critical remarks in which the translators criticize Goldseer's approach to the history of religion. We cannot know with certainty what were the three translators' reasons for including these remarks in their works. They could have been ardent believers who appreciated the value of Goldseer's research but felt obliged at the same time to defend the prevalent version of their faith. They also could have written their remarks in order to defend themselves from being accused of disseminating irreligious ideas by translating Goldseer into Arabic. Dissemination of such ideas, to say the least, is not very well appreciated in the Muslim world. I would like to complete my remarks by quoting a passage from the Encyclopedia of Orientalists, Mausuat al-Mustashrikin by Abdul Rahman al-Badawi, uh, who um, was professor of philosophy in several Egyptian uh, universities. Badawi includes in his, um, in his uh, account of Goldseer's achievements the following statement. Fi Womin Maktabihi fi Madina Budapest. Walla Goldseher Akthara min Rubi Karn Shamsan Satia is Tamara Tursilu fi Alam el Bohus el Islamia Dawan Yubadi do Kalilan Kalilan Mayohitu binawahil Hayat el Islamia min Valam. Woyuniru as Subul. Amam al Bahisin, fil Wathaik, alati, subjilat fiha, dalika, tilkal hayat. Yanmu ala hararatihi, jilun daham, min, min, 
ממן כאן הוא בלעמסי על קריב, אהו מוליהו מן האימתל מוסטשריקין. So in his office in the city of Budapest, Goldseher was for more than a quarter of a century a shining sun, constantly sending rays of light into the world of Islamic studies, rays which slowly dissipate the darkness enveloping the religious life of Islam, illuminating the way for those who study the documents in which this life is recorded. The warmth of this light enables the growth of a large generation of those who were recently or are now the leading Orientalists. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Professor Friedman, for your very fascinating lecture, uh, in which were highlighted by your personal memories and your father's personal memories of Ignaz Goldsier, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, now I kindly ask Professor Kinga Deveni, the senior librarian of the Oriental Collection of the Library and Information Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and associate professor of the Corvinus University in Budapest to give her memorial lecture, whose title is the portrait of Goldziher, the man behind the scholar. Please, Professor Deveni. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear Mr. President, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult to talk today after this distinguished talk we have just heard uh, about Goldziher's reception uh, among the Arabs. Uh, but being the curator of the Goldziher collection of the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, it was a great pleasure for me to have been asked to participate at this memorial conference organized to commemorate the centenary of the death of Ignaz Goldziher. I also gladly accepted this invitation because in addition to talking on the topic of my paper, which will be the man behind the scholar, it gives me an opportunity to mention the results of the Goldsier project, if I may say so. Uh, I have been engaged in with several colleagues during the past year. It is, as I have said, not an easy task to talk about Goldsier, uh, and not only because of the previous lecture, but also since much has been written during the past 100 years about him as a scholar, his embeddedness in 19th century Jewish scholarship, and after the publication of the Tagebuch, even about his psychological traits, as could be gleaned from the pages of this diary, started on his 40th birthday and continued until 1919 in German. The past few days witnessed an international conference on Gautier's correspondence convened by four persons and institutions within the framework of the Alexander for Humboldt Research Prize. And more importantly, from the point of view of this institution, which is the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, uh, the past few days also witnessed the realization of a new website by the Library and Information Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences dedicated to Gautier's life and works which also provides, and this is very important in my view, a common platform for his full text searchable publications, including books, journal articles, reviews, and lexicon entries alike. An exhibition also opens in this building to present his life and works through some of the items from his bequest. The highlight of that exhibition, in my view, is undoubtedly Goldsier's treasured Freytag, an Arabic Latin lexicon compiled in the 1830s as an amended and amplified version of a 17th century dictionary by the Dutch Jacobus Golius, which had in its turn been based on exhaustive Arabic dictionaries. To his copy, which he got in exchange for cataloging a group of Arabic manuscripts for the booksellers List and Franke in Leipzig, Goldsier has amplified entries and corrected others throughout his life. During the Second World War, it was preserved by his last student, 
Joseph de Chomody, who had walled it up in the wine cellar of his family house, as we can read it in his 1961 article entitled My Reminiscences of Ignaz Gaultier. And for several years, this dictionary was considered to have been lost. But now, today, and until the mid-February, you will be able to scroll through it uh, thanks to its digitization. The present contribution to, today, to, to today's commemorative lectures does not wish to evaluate the scholarly legacy of Gaultier. On the contrary, the aim of the forthcoming presentation is to round up the image of Gaultier as a man, although Professor Marwood has pointed out uh, in his opening talks that nothing can be said about him in this way. But I think that we can still uh, present a picture and remind people today in the 21st century of his uh, features. And uh, you can see the main points of my presentation on the slide. The portrait will be based on printed and manuscript sources written by Gaussier's contemporaries who had first-hand experiences of his personality, the most important sources being his correspondence and the letters written by himself kept in the Oriental collection and the Department of, the Manus of Manuscripts of the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, respectively, supplemented by published memories of his students and acquaintances. Gaultier, as is well known and oft quoted, has pledged to be faithful to the religion of his forefathers, to the name of his family, and to his Hungarian homeland. These are all very remarkable in themselves, considering the circumstances and the period he lived in. So let us first elaborate on these three pledges. Faithfulness to his Jewish religion during the general climate of the end of the 19th century, favoring the assimilation of Hungarian nationalities, including Jews, coupled with covertly and from time to time overtly prevalent anti-Semitism, could not have been an easy task, especially for a person in Gaultier's position, more particularly during his deanship in the academic year of 1917-1918 and the rising tide of anti-Semitism which reached the academy in the summer of 1919 when he preferred to resign from office as president of section one, that of linguistics and literary scholarship. Koltiher did not only practice his Jewish faith and was long serving secretary of the Jewish community, but he also lived for many years at number four Hollow Street in the heart of Jewish Pest. This milieu might be best characterized by an excerpt from a sketch of the Hungarian writer Jano Heltai, born Eugen Herzl, the cousin of Theodor Herzl, the father of modern political Zionism. I quote, dark little coffee shop far away in a strange district, right in the middle of the Pest ghetto in Hollow Street. Big bearded, noisy Orthodox Jews in fantastic kaftans with hats on their heads, long pipes in their mouth, and puffy cakes next to their gray coffee, traded and played cards there day and night. The only thing Gaultier had in common with the patrons of the coffee shop mentioned in this description was that he was a heavy smoker of long pipes. He, however, did not frequent the small coffee shops of his street but had his table and enjoyed the company of his friends in the upmarket cafe of Hotel Bristol along the Danube. In 1894, he became the first professor of Jewish faith at the University of Pest, obeyed the appointment of the Jewish Gustav Sassi Schwartz in 1892, predated Goldsier's appointment. Schwartz, however, soon converted to Christianity. He was, without doubt, however, the first dean of Jewish faith. This appointment also entailed several ceremonial functions, which Gaultier accomplished with great solemnity, except for those processions which were linked to Catholic festivals, where he always arranged for somebody to substitute him. In this respect, it is interesting to note that despite the testimony of Gaultier's diary on this matter, his contemporaries remembered otherwise and even alleged that he participated in the honor of marching during processions next to the Holy Rite 
That is to say, the relic assumed to be the naturally mummified right hand of King Saint Stephen I, the first king of Hungary. Now let us turn to his second pledge, that of faithfulness to his family name. In a letter to Theodor Nöldeke, that you can see in German, uh, typed uh, by the secretary uh, of the academy, uh, so in this letter to Theodor Nöldeke, dated the 2nd of November 1910, Goltzer wrote quite lengthily about his family name and his views concerning its correct original form based on archival sources. It should, however, be remarked that despite his efforts and intentions, all his re relatives, except for his immediate family members, continue to spell their names with an added E before the H. Goldsier wrote, the Goldsier, I quote, the Goldsiers innovated this form of the name as an emendation of the unorthographical Goldsier. It is a bida, an innovation. Years ago, I gave my ophthalmologist cousin the signet of our common grandfather, whose name, according to Jewish custom, he bears. It clearly says W. Goldsier, with an I only. This letter spelling seems to come from the fact that the name's form is probably a transcription from the Hebrew Goltzier, and there was no room for an extension by E. If there had been, my Hamburg ancestors would have inserted an Ein, which they sensibly did not do. In the Hamburg Jewish archives, there are many documents with this form of the name. My great-great-grandfather immigrated to Western Hungary from Hamburg. Some members of my family, in further degrees, carry the family name Hamburger, which was probably given them here, neglecting their original name. Now let us turn our attention to his faithfulness to his Hungarian homeland. It is a well-known fact that despite his late promotion to full professorship at the University of Budapest, which happened on the 1st of August 1894, and to the rank of ordinary salaried professor of Semitic philology, only on the 24th of May, 1905, it never crossed Goltzier's mind to accept whatever position he was offered outside Hungary. Based on his diary, he sometimes seems to regret not having accepted any of the positions offered to him. We, however, shouldn't take for granted everything he states there. Goltzier was a highly sensitive and fragile person. His sensitivity and fragility seem to have been caused since his early childhood by the continuous mental strain he was exposed to. His diary, as has often been noted, helped him to keep his mental health that was endangered by various factors. These factors range from not being promoted to full professorship until an advanced age and despite an earlier promise, through his employment as secretary of the Jewish community, which consumed precious time he could have allocated to research, to his frequent ailments, which often resulted in his inability to work because of sleeplessness and severe headache. Be as it may, the diary was a life savior for Goltier and a platform where he could express his innermost feelings without hurting anybody. Through his letters, a completely different personality emerges one that resembles very much the surviving descriptions by his students, friends, and acquaintances who unanimously characterize him as, I quote from Shomogi, an exceptionally attractive, end of quote, personality, who despite his towering knowledge was able to hold the conversation on an equal footing, even with a child. It can be stated that he vented his anger in his diary had he wanted to accept any of these positions, since they were offered to him at various stages in his life, he could have done so. He, however, never ever considered these positions, not even for a minute, but the moment they were offered, he was ready with his refusal. Suffice it to quote here two proposals, one coming from Cambridge and the other from Cairo. Upon the death of Robertson Smith in 1894, E.G. Brown did his best to convince Goldsier to accept the Sir Thomas Adams Chair in Arabic of Cambridge University, as is evidenced by his three letters. The first letter was written on the 25th of April 1894 and was just briefly noted by Goldsier in his diary three days later. It was written by two Cambridge scholars, E.G. Brown, in agreement with A.A. Bevan, 
neither of whom wished to offer themselves as candidates, but who both felt that they, I quote, must, if possible, induce someone of the great Arabic scholars in Europe to settle amongst them and to take the vacant professorship, end of quote. The informal inquiry, however, was quite concrete in the sense that it not only mentioned the very tempting annual salary of 700 pounds, which would correspond today to about 93,000 pounds, and which was approximately the double of Gautier's annual income in Hungary at that time, but also that Gautier should only take up residence during term time, which amounts to half a year split between three periods of two months. In this letter, to Brown was still entertaining great hopes and hopeful he remained after Gautier's quick and immediate refusal, as we can see in his next letter, dated the 5th of May, 1894. In his refusal, Gautier mentioned his family obligations, that in addition to his own wife and children, he was the only support of his sister's orphans. In return, Brown eulogized Gautier saying, I quote, your feelings do you honor. Here is indeed a proof of the sweetness and nobility of your soul, which is moreover so richly endowed. Everyone recognizes your rare knowledge and the high degree of your science, but I admire and love you even more for this sublime devotion to these poor orphans, the children of your sister." End of quote. No wonder, however, that he sensed that this was just an excuse. After a lengthy praise of Gautier in Arabic, he even showed him a solution by suggesting that he can bring the children and all the family with him to Britain. He didn't fail to point out that the double income would ensure the livelihood of the whole family. They wouldn't lose their attachment to their homeland and mother tongue and repeatedly asked Gautier to reconsider his position. Even after having received Gautier's final refusal, he insisted and gave him a last opportunity to change his mind. Another invitation came from Cairo. Today's Cairo University was founded under the name of Egyptian University in 1908 by prominent Egyptian intellectuals and public figures, its first rector being Prince Fuad, the future King Fuad I. In the autumn of 1911 and again in 1912, he invited Gautier to teach a course in Arabic on the history of Arabic philosophy. Several persons from Gautier's friend, the Hungarian architect Max Hertz, who for more than two decades directed the conservation of Islamic and Coptic monuments in Egypt, through the then Prime Minister of Hungary and the Foreign Minister of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, tried to convince him to accept this invitation, which was deemed to serve national interests as well. All this, however, was of no avail. Already concerning the Cambridge invitation, Gautier noted in his diary that he couldn't do anything else but stay in Hungary. But what was his real reason for staying in Hungary? Can it solely be attributed to his vow? An answer may be found in his letter to Duncan B. MacDonald, a Scottish Presbyterian cleric who lived most of his life in Hartford, Connecticut, and who is primarily remembered today as one of the initiators of Arabic and Islamic studies in the United States, with whom Gaultier developed an intimate friendship through correspondence. In an English letter dated the 17th of November 1911, he noted, I quote, for the moment I feel not strong enough in spirits to go to foreign countries to teach and to act publicly. Some months ago, I got a, also a flattering invitation from the University of Uppsala for a series of lectures in German. Perhaps my humors will change. For this moment, I am not very unternehmungslustig." End of quote. The same inability was voiced by Gaultier in his second refusal, which he sent to Prince Fuad on the 24th of July, 1912. This time in French saying, Je ne me s'entends pas en état de quitter Budapest, which means roughly the same, that he doesn't feel to. I'm oh, sorry about that. It's my fault. It's moving without my intentions. Right. After this brief presentation of Gaultier's adherence to his triple vow, let us turn our attention to his appreciation by friends and fellow scholars 
in and outside Hungary. The personality of Goltzier, his well-known geniality, is well reflected in Brown's questions concerning Sao Horgenia, a possible candidate for the Cambridge position, from which it appears that the university was not only looking for a scholar of high academic standing, but also an affable person who is at the same time an excellent confrere as for the other dons, as Brown puts it. Goldsier's students and younger contemporaries from the scholarly world, as is evidenced by several letters and reminiscences, could all experience his easygoing and benevolent attitude, irrespective of their backgrounds. Christian, Muslim, and Jewish students and scholars alike, both from Hungary and the four corners of the world, were greatly influenced by him. It would be impossible to list those who expressed their indebtedness to Goldsier's benevolence. Suffice us to mention only a few who enjoyed his sympathy in various ways, and uh, some of these uh, you can also see on the slides. The young Egyptian student of Al-Azhar, Ibrahim al-Laqani, who when Gautier had to depart, wrote a poem eulogizing him. Abdul Baha, the other son of Baha'u'llah and the head of the Baha'i faith from 1892 until his death, who met Gaultier during his short stay in Budapest in 1913, and who was so impressed that he couldn't wait to see him again. And by the way, he also sent him a Persian rug. A Muslim student from Central Asia who joined him during his holiday on the North Sea Island to read Judeo-Arabic Geniza fragments. Prominent Christian scholars like Louis Massignon, Duncan Black MacDonald, or even missionaries like William H. D. Gardner who all turned to him for advice and support. And even his ordinary Hungarian students, who whenever possible remembered him and sent him messages just to express their gratitude for his kindness and compassion. As you can see it on this postcard, uh, sent by a student uh, stopping in the town, the country town of Sornok, on the way home after his exams. Although Gaultier was often described as working silently in his retreat, he was fond of being in the company of his friends and students, and appears to have been an overwhelmingly amiable person, who generally was the life and soul of the party. At the same time, he often complained in his letters to his intimate friends about his lack of necessary time, and that was the last point on my first slide, to be devoted to research. But despite all his difficulties and often tedious obligations, he always showed compassion to those who approached him for whatever reason. He stimulated his helpless or discouraged students and never did he make them feel his intellectual superiority. His rare predisposition of natural modesty in a scholar of his stature can serve as an inspiration and an example to follow by all of us. And I would like to thank you by these concluding remarks for your kind attention. Thank you for Professor Divini for her very interesting uh, lecture showing us some details, some very vivid details of the person behind the scholar. And then uh, now the second section of our conference is over and the thir third section of the commemoration is a scientific conference entitled Punishment and Reward. The first part of this scientific conference will be held here in the ceremonial hall of the Palace of the Academy, <clears throat> while the second part will take place in the building of the Avicenna Institute of Middle Eastern Studies in Pilischava. The first part of the conference, in the first part of the conference, we will hear two lectures. Uh, may I ask uh, now Professor Jair Lorberbaum from the Faculty of Law at Barhan University in Ramat Gan, Israel, to deliver his lecture with the title of Maimonides on Divine Reward and Punishment as a Necessary Belief. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, 
first of all, I want to thank the organizers of uh, this wonderful conference, a memorial conference, for uh, inviting me and organizing this, uh, uh, this uh, memorial conference for this great scholar, uh, Ignaz Goldziher. Um, as you'll see, my uh, <coughs> presentation will be on Maimonides on divine reward and punishment as a necessary belief. This is a very wide, uh, I would say, topic, and what I could say about it, it would be kind of, uh, you know, in a very general terms, each and every, I would say, uh, picture here that you'll see on the presentation could be uh, a topic for, uh, I would say, um, an, an essay or a lecture in and of itself. I'll speak about my Maimonides uh, as a lawyer and a philosopher. Um, as you probably know, Maimonides was probably the greatest halachist lawyer in the past thousand years, some would say, in the Jewish tradition in general. He wrote a lot of, uh, I would say, legal books within the Jewish tradition. The, well, the most well-known is his famous code, which encompasses all Jewish halacha, all Jewish law. Now, you have to remind yourself that when you speak about the Jewish tradition, law and halacha is probably the center of this tradition. It encompasses basically whatever human beings do from the moment they open their eyes till the time they go to sleep, and even during the sleep. They have rules above rules about how to conduct themselves uh, basically in every imaginable or inimaginable area of life. And this is a very long <laughs> tradition. Some like it, some criticize it as, 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 as we know, especially Christians, but not only them. And Maimonides was the expert on this field, and uh, he ded dedicated his life to the study and to the summarizing and writing this huge and amazing uh, code, which is called in Hebrew, Mishneh Torah. Uh, at the same time, Maimonides was the greatest philosopher in the Jewish tradition, uh, which is <coughs> the main book that he wrote. This is, was not the only book, but the main book that he wrote was uh, the, uh, uh, the Guide of the Perplexed. And if you think about it, this is really something amazing, which I can't think about any kind of parallel in any other culture or tradition in which you think about a single person who wrote the most important book in law for the past thousand years or so, and the most important book in philosophy. Usually, because I had these both trainings, both in law and philosophy, usually, Philosophers are not good lawyers, and uh, I would say that lawyers are not good philosophers. Usually don't go to, they don't mix together quite well. Here you find a person, not only a great philosopher and a great lawyer, but a person who basically, uh, I would say, uh, wrote the, 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 the most important book, both in law and philosophy, in a gap of something like uh, 10 years, both of them really amazing Books And this is a rare phenomenon, I think, not only in the Jewish tradition, one could say in, uh, in any kind of uh, tradition. Just to give you one example of Maimonides, here you could see one of a manuscript, his, a manuscript of his, uh, <laughs> a page of a manuscript of his uh, great work, The Code, and you could see down below the, uh, his own, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, handwriting in which he attests to the copy editing of this uh, manuscript. It is interesting that from all Jewish thinkers in the Middle Ages, we still till today have some manuscript written by Maimonides' own handwriting. His own books reached us today, and we have his own books written by his own handwriting. This is one example of it. I could speak more about this uh, manuscript, but I have only 20, 20 something minutes just to speak about my topic, which is. Now, as a lawyer and a philosopher, one of the main things that he did was develop a philosophy of law and a theory of halacha. 
One of the main, I would say, things that really were typical to Maimonides was the fact that he was very self-reflective on everything that he did. He gave an account, a methodological account, a kind of reflective account of what, <coughs> what he's doing when he did halakha, when he was deciding law, when he wrote philosophy, when we, he thought about social issues. Not only that he, <coughs> that he discussed these issues, he always discussed the way he discusses these issues. In a way, he was probably one of the most reflective writers in the Middle Ages, especially in the Jewish tradition. And one of the things that really is typical to him is the fact that as a, <coughs> as a person who uh, developed uh, Jewish law, he also developed, I have this, uh, as a person who developed Jewish law, he also developed a theory of the Jewish law, which was based on his theory and philosophy of law. What is exactly the difference between theory of Allah and theory of law? This is the difference between giving a theory of a specific legal tradition or a legal system, which is Allah, which is based on a general legal philosophy, which, is, which was his view about the field of law in general. Interestingly enough, uh, just one second, we're... Uh, interestingly enough, this subject of the philosophy of law, not so much the theory of halakha, philosophy of law, wasn't a subject which enough scholars dealt with. This is a, <laughs> this is a subject which is still a desiderata in the study of, uh, of Maimonides. Now I want to turn, given this kind of background, I want to turn to the issue at hand, which is his theory of, of divine uh, punishment and reward. Generally speaking, when we think about Maimonides, we are speaking in terms of his philosophy. He was an Aristotelian, neoplatonic philosopher. He believed in God's unique, absolute unity. He has this philosophical Aristotelian combined with a neoplatonic worldview and the view of the divine in which the center of it was the idea that God is the absolute unity. This is something he took and it was deeply influenced by Ibn Sina, Avicenna, uh, which he took some distinctions and ideas from him, developing it into what is known as this <coughs> is very famous negative theology. The basis for this perception of unity is the idea that he rejected completely in every way one could think about the idea that God has his corporeal or God has any kind of, I would say, personality or any aspect of personality. He developed a unique, I would say within the Jewish tradition, a unique, very, <coughs> I would say, abstract theology, very abstract religion. He was, as I said, influenced by both Islam here and many, I would say, uh, uh, Islamic uh, philosophers. As a person who developed this kind of theology, he rejected the idea of divine uh, reward and punishment altogether. This was <laughs> completely absurd from a philosophical point of view, because if God is completely, <laughs> is in absolute unity, he has no personality, he doesn't respond in any way that we think about in terms of reward and punishment. In that sense, it is, <coughs> it, it is a result of his theology, this idea of a complete rejection of reward and punishment in this idea. Yet, at the same time, he developed a social political need, or he thought that there was a social political need for the myth, as I call it, of divine punishment. He developed what one could call a noble myth taken from the writings of Plato, and especially the uh, interpretations given to Plato by Al-Farabi in most of his books, and he subscribed to this idea that in order to develop uh, a well-structured city, <coughs> a just city, a virtuous city, within the confinement of Allah, you need this kind of social political, <coughs> social political myth of divine reward 
and punishment. Pay attention to the fact that Maimonides thought about the general public as multitude. Multitude for him was a basic, I would say, concept which one could find it, <coughs> which Maimonides utilizes it almost in any other page of the Guide of the Perplex. For him, he uses the idea of, <coughs> of the multitude almost for, in any aspect of the social, I would say, stratum of his, uh, his philosophy. And in order to control and put this kind of uh, multitude in law and order, there is a <coughs> great profound need of this divine myth of uh, this myth of divine punishment uh, and reward. Now, what I want to do in the rest of my talk is just to show you his approach to this idea and how did he developed in one of those famous texts in the in the code this kind of concept, which, in a sense, contradicts completely his view, his theological views. So let's turn <coughs> to uh, one of a famous chapter in the Guide of Toplex, Part Three, Chapter Twenty Eight, in which he makes a clear distinction between what he called correct beliefs and necessary beliefs. Uh, just uh, a few words about the background of this. Uh, Chapter. This chapter is taken from a chunk of uh, chapters in the third part of the Guide of the Perplex, which are dedicated to the um, explaining or giving reasons for the commandments. Giving reasons for the 613 commandments, which are 613 bodies of law within the Jewish tradition, uh, was something that was important for Maimonides as part of his philosophical endeavor. And he dedicated 25 chapters in his uh, seminal book, The Guide of the Perplex, to giving reasons to each and every commandment of the Torah, of the Jewish tradition. This is uh, maybe the most encompassing and uh, syst <coughs> systematic treatment of the commandments in the Jewish Middle Ages. This is a book within a book in The Guide of the Perplex, 25 chapters. Within these 25 chapters, he dedicates uh, something like eight, nine chapters to methodological and theoretical, I would say, basis for the uh, uh, dealing with the issue of the uh, commandments. And one of them is uh, chapter 28. Let, let me read a few paragraphs from this uh, chapter. Right, my mind, says follow. Among the things to which attention ought to be directed is that you should know that in regard to the correct opinions through which the ultimate perfection will be obtained, the law has communicated only their end and made a call to believe in them in a summary way. That is, to believe in the existence of the deity, his unity, his knowledge, his power, his will, and his eternity. All these points are ultimate ends which can be made clear in detail and through definitions only after one knows many opinions. Now here it deals with the text of the Bible, the text of the Torah, the Holy Scripture. And he says that the text of the Torah, which is aimed to the multitude, to the average reader, it can't be, it can't possibly be a philosophical book which deals with complicated theological issues. What it could do is just to declare the basic beliefs in a very general summary way. So it says that God exists, God has a unity, knowledge, power, but in order to understand these things in a philosophical, theological way, one needs to dedicate his life. This is only the few. So what the Torah does is just gives you the general idea about what God is. One could ask whether if you read the Bible, you find these ideas there, whether God is really is a complete unity and knowledge and so on and so forth, Maimonides makes all the efforts that he can to show that this is the case about the Bible in the general way. Yet Maimonides says that in the same way, the law also makes a call to adopt certain beliefs, belief in which is necessary for the sake of political welfare. Such, for instance, is our belief that he, may he be exalted, is violently angry with those who disobey him. 
and that it is therefore necessary to fear him and to dread him and to take care not to disobey. Let me read another paragraph. He continues to say, in the same way, the law also takes call to adopt certain beliefs, belief in which is necessary for the sake of political welfare. This is the, I would say, summary of this book. Such, for instance, is our belief that he, may he be exalted, is violently angry with those who disobey him. And that is, <coughs> and that it is therefore necessary for him to dread him <coughs> and to take care not to disobey. I shall explain that all these and others of the same kind are indubitably related to one of the three notions referred to. So here he speaks about the basic aims of the commandments. They are either to the welfare of belief, namely to implant true beliefs, which are true beliefs in the multitude, or the welfare of the conditions of the city which is achieved through two things, abolition of reciprocal wrongdoing, which is law and order and well-being of the state, and acquisition of excellent characters. Sum up, he says, you have to know that in other cases, the belief is necessary for the abolition of reciprocal wrongdoing for the acquisition of a noble moral quality. As for instance, they believe that he may he be exalted, has a violent anger against those who do injustice, according to what it is said, and <coughs> my wrath shall wax hot and I will kill, and so on and so forth. And here it quotes many, I would say, uh, biblical verses in which tells you the story about God's wrath and anger and jealousy and the fact that, the fact that he responds to the wicked and rewards the justice, <coughs> the, the, the righteous, and so on and so forth. Now, pay attention to the fact, just to add a few more, I would say, comments to this distinction. Correct uh, views, in Hebrew you say it, amitot amitiot, correct views has to do with these general views about God, which are true, but the average person doesn't know them in the philosophical sense because he doesn't know them, he can't prove them. He knows them in a kind of a very general way. When he speaks about necessary beliefs, necessary beliefs are beliefs which are necessary for the well-being of society. If you think about these necessary beliefs, the main example that he gives, he has some examples, but here the main example he gives is the belief in a world in divine reward and punishment. Divine reward and punishment, it's more punishment than reward. Keep in mind, because he stresses the, <laughs> the punishment more than the reward, but here and there he also speaks about the reward. And that is interesting when you think about philosophy of law in general. I won't go into this, uh, this important distinction within legal philosophy, which the state punishes more than rewards, though you, think, you tend to think that in the modern times, maybe it's just the other way around. Uh, anyways, my monody stress, <laughs> stress that. But pay attention to the fact that when you speak about necessary beliefs, these beliefs, of course, are wrong. They are untrue, but they are necessary. They are necessary for creating law and order within society which consists of the multitude. Now, why is it untrue? Because if you think about God's unity and God's lacking any kind of personality in the, I would say, mundane sense, there's no, <laughs> no way of thinking about, speaking about uh, uh, God rewarding or punishing or being angry or, or, or retaliating or being jealous or doing all these things that the Bible ascribed to him in every other chapter. Yet my mother says the fact that the Bible does that, this is because the Bible tries to enhance necessary beliefs. The fact that these two beliefs which are given to the public, namely the, the, the true beliefs on the one hand, which is the abstract God, the complete unity, and so on and so forth, without the philosophical foundation, but the, I would say, the general <coughs> sense of that, and the, on the other hand, telling the multitude that God has wrath and jealousy and so on and so forth, the fact that they squarely negate one another, this doesn't really disturb my mind, is because he doesn't think that the multitude really cares or knows or pay attention to the fact that these two 
negate each other in <laughs> really squarely. Now, just to give you one example, in a chapter in his code in which he uh, develops this kind of myth, the code which is aimed to the public, aimed to the average reader, to the multitude, let me read two or three paragraphs which are really, I think, amazing from uh, a body of law in Mishneh Torah in the code, which is taken from the law of repentance. It, in Hebrew, it's called the Hilchot Tshuva. This book was originally, uh, uh, I would say, one of the only, I would say, books Maimonides wrote originally in Hebrew, marvelous Hebrew, you have to say, and uh, let me read two, three paragraphs from this uh, body of law. Maimonides says as follows. Each and every person has merits and sins. A person whose merits exceed his sins is termed righteous. A person whose sins exceed his merits is termed wicked. In Hebrew, it's uh, tzaddik and rasha. If his sins and merits are equal, exactly equal, he's called, this is the term in Hebrew, benoni. The translation could be in between, which I, I don't think there is anybody who really is equal in the sense that, you know, you'll see in a, in a minute why not. The same applies to an entire country. If the merit of all its inhabitants exceed their sins, it is righteous. If their sins are greater, it is wicked. That country. The same applies to the entire world, says Maimonides. And then he goes on in Halachatu, in the <coughs> Halachatu he says, if a person's sins exceeds its merits, he will immediately die because of his wickedness. And he quotes Jeremiah 30, 14 states, I have smitten you for the multitude of your transgressions. Similarly, a country whose sins are great will immediately be obliterated. As implied in Genesis 18:20, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, etc., etc. In regard to the entire world as well, were its inhabitants' sins to be greater than their merits, they would immediately be destroyed. As Genesis 6-5 says, and this is referring to the flood, the famous flood relates, God saw the evil of man was great and said, I will destroy man, etc., etc. I have to say that when I read these paragraphs, it's always amazing how my mother is could write such paragraphs. Two minutes. One minute or two minutes. How my mother is could write such paragraphs which are mythical through and through speaking about a world, moral world order, which pay attention to the fact that here it works in a kind of a mechanical way. Even here, he doesn't ascribe to God a personality which reacts to human beings' deeds. It is as if the, uh, I would say, the physical, uh, uh, I would say, law, rule, which is, is basically active here, whenever you do more sins than merits, everything would be destroyed in a kind of, a, I would say, almost technical sense. But then my mind goes on to say the following. This reckoning is not calculated only on the basis of the number of merits and sins, but also takes into account their magnitude. There are some merits which outweigh many sins as implied by, and he gives a verse. In contrast, the sin may outweigh many merits as states and so on and so forth. And he concludes, the weighing of sins and merits is carried out according to the wisdom of the knowing God. He knows how to measure merits against sins. So he, in a way, takes a, takes a step back saying, look, but we can't possibly know what the calculation of divine is. This is only he knows about. Of course, this is the answer, immediate answer to the question, how come wicked people are not destroyed, wicked countries, the whole world? No, no. The issue is that we don't know. He is the only one who knows how to calculate a sin vis-a-vis -vis 
the merit and so on and so forth. So he kind of takes it, he's a bit attenuating this. But I have to read this, you know, when I read this, I, as I said, I, I can't believe my mother just wrote this, but this appears in the center of one of the most important, I would say, bodies of law in the code. <coughs> the law of repentance over there. Uh, I have to say that most of the, I would say, uh, observant Jews, they are familiar much more with this text than the text I read from the God of the Perplexed. They think this is the Maimonides' views. Of course, this Maimonides' views, of course, this, this view is, it could be understood only on the basis of this distinction I, <coughs> I made from, uh, I offered from uh, uh, Guide 328. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lorberbaum, for his very fascinating uh, lecture and uh, introducing us a very special person, one of the very few who can combine in himself law and philosophy. Uh, and now, for the last uh, lecture of this uh, morning, may I kindly ask uh, Professor Jules Janssens, or the research collaborator of the the Wolf Mansion Center for Ancient Medieval and Renaissance Philosophy at the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium, to give his lecture with the title of Ibn Sina on the life in the, uh, on the, life in the there, hereafter and the issue of human responsibility. Professor Janssens, please. Let me first of all thank the organizers, the Academy of Hungarian, uh, Klaus Marot and the Institute of Pilichan and the Avicenna Institute for having invited me to this special event in memory of the great, very great Hungarian Jewish scholar Ignaz Koltzinger, who did a marvelous job at this time. We forget about that and we were remembered earlier this morning. In a footnote, in one among his so many others, of his seminal works, the Richtungen der Islamischen Koran als Legal, calls here, noted that Ibn Sina, for those who don't know, lived circa 980, 34, complained in his pointers and reminders that the view of those who know, the Arifun, is the Gilscheibe, the spotters, their Oberflechlichen, now, the superficials are undoubtedly, in Ibn Sina's mind, the theologians of his time, the Mutakalimun, who, inter alia, accused the philosophers to have developed a theory of spiritual resurrection besides the one of the corporeal resurrection. Uh, we come back to that later. Now, um, Another thing I have to decide before starting the proper topic of my talk is that Ibn Sina had made a sharp distinction between the elite and the masses, especially among which the life in the hereafter figures. Ibn Sina has extensively dealt with this topic in a wide range of works covering a wide space span of his philosophical career, from a relatively early work as the provenance and destination to the commonly considered relative late pointers and reminders. Even if the basic ideas seem to have remained largely unchanged, one detects the well, uh, as well minor modifications. One which immediately strikes the eye is the expression of the possibility for a given category of resurrected souls, namely that of the common masses, to have imaginary representations, thanks to their having a connection with a or several celestial body or bodies. However, in my view, one of the important issues so far not that much discussed that is raised by Ibn Sina's doctrine of the life in the hereafter is the question or whether it leaves or not any place for human responsibility and ends for human freedom. 
Of course, my talk today, uh, I've only 20 minutes, so I, I'm not able to give all the details and to argue and to give a final answer to this extremely difficult question. Let me observe that already in these divisions of uh, wisdom or of philosophy, uh, Ibn Sina mentioned the decusor of the destination as one of the derived branches of metaphysics. So this is important. It's not something which belongs to the theory of the soul. It, doesn't, it is not discussed in the book of the soul, but in metaphysics. He starts by insisting that even if there would be not any bodily resurrection, there would be for man, due to the survival of his spirit, a non-bodily recompense or a non-bodily punishment. As to the bodily kind of recompense of punishment, it can be explained by reason, but only by religious revelation. So, even if the spiritual kind of recompense is higher than the corporeal, even Sina insists that, I quote, however, God has been most generous towards his pious servants in promising them throughout the most of his prophets, the combination of both kinds of happiness, the spiritual by the survival of the soul and the bodily by the resurrection of the body. If I understand well this, even Sina here recognizes the limits of reason and of philosophy. In his providence and destination, even Sina offers further details. Most importantly, he introduces a distinction between souls that have an intellectual perfection on the one hand and ignorant souls on the other hand. Regarding the form, he insists that those who possess such soul can only attain real happiness when their soul is completely separated from body and from all submissive attitudes towards it. In adding this later condition, even Sina makes clear that the sole intellectual perfection is not enough to become fully happy in the hereafter. There is also a need to have been morally perfected, i.e. to possess justice, which can only be attained when the soul occupies an intermediary position between two opposed moral qualities, a view directly based on the Aristotelian ethical idea of the mean, as once more, Colsier has already noticed in his Medanische Studien. But somewhat later, even Stina states, I quote, however, because these attitudes of submission to the body are foreign to the soul's essence, it is likely that they will come Sorry, it's likely that I will cease after a passage of time. The religious laws seem to have said something similar. Indeed, it is said there, a sinful believer will not remain eternally in torment. Hence, in the long run, the, on the theoretical level, intellectually perfected man will always experience the ultimate degree of happiness. This sounds as if he has almost no moral responsibility, but it is clearly not the case. On the one hand, even Sina leaves no room for doubting that he had a moral attitude, that if he had a bad moral attitude, this will imply that after that he will suffer a period of suffering, the intensity and duration of which will de be dependent on one's moral shortcomings. On the other hand, the full development of the intellect implies the perfection of both the theoretical and the practical intellect. To neglect the latter is obviously an unphilosophical attitude. But optimistic as he is, Ibn Sina, being aware of the human weaknesses on the one hand, and of God's mercy, on the other, interprets in a sunny way the destiny of the sinful believers 
in terms of a non-eternal condemnation to hell. However, he points to a native condemnation with regard to, I quote, who is conscious of the real perfection of his soul in this world, who acquires in view of his soul a desire for it, and then renounces to make the efforts to fully acquire the intellect in act, thereby becoming resolved to fanaticism or unbelief. Therefore, not every intellectual gifted man attains automatically the state of supreme happiness. If the, uh, the elite is not auto automatically safeguarded, what about the masses, who are weak-minded, somehow even ignorant, from the purely intellectual point of view? Are they condemned, as are the, uh, as the last part mentioned part of the elite? Here, even Sina presents what might be seen at first sight as a rhetorical, so what misleading explanation. In fact, he states that they will survive according to their specific religious beliefs. Hence, they will experience, according to have, their having developed a virtuous or vicious life, uh, in, according to the religious law in which they believe, bodily happiness or misery, although on an imaginary level. Here as well, such individual is responsible for the specific nature of his imaginary life in the hereafter, i.e. happy or unhappy. All this looks hardly compatible with a hard determinism which would imply a strong idea of predestination. Certainly, there is an element of determination in the very fact that someone believe, uh, belong by birth to the group of the elite, while others do so to be the one of the masses. However, so I'll skip this because otherwise I will go forward. Uh, now, in two other... Three tarsis, which are generally considered early, uh, but the uh, datation of Ibn Sina's work is still uh, to, be determined, to, to be determined in a specific way. It's still much study to be done. In uh, one of them, the, uh, these two, one comes to a more intellectual approach, a more outspoken intellectual approach. One is this, uh, is the one on the treatise on destination, on the occasion of the Feast of Immolation, the Adawiya, uh, where even Sina uh, discusses once more uh, all these categories, uh, as in the, in the, the work I just mentioned. But one thing is uh, striking here, he adds a category, uh, namely the imperfect and purified soul, which had an idea, but with that no idea whatsoever of its real perfection, and which was is the, uh, 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 which Ibn Sina attributes to the madman and to young ch children who have died very early, so they had not be able to develop their intellectual capacities, and the madman have no intellectual capacities. Now, what is amazing about this is that he said they will have no reward nor punishment. So in this case, there seems no, to be no place for any divine mercy, which we discovered before. And uh, moreover, um, this seems to be really uh, a very, very intellectual emphasis. And moreover, an another point in, in this uh, work where it differs from the provenance and destination is where he says that um, the, perfect, the, the perfect intellectual man, so those who are capable of developing their intellectual capacities who believe to the elite, who belong to the elite, that they are, uh, even if they are lived a life according to the law, so if they are purified, if they are morally perfect life, at, at the most perfect life, they will still be condemned eternally. Now, this seems to me 
only explain, uh, you can ex only explain, explain if you get the mind that this treatise is probably written as a polemic, polemical treatise against the theologians. And the people here are the mind are undoubtedly the theologians who defended, of course, the law, but didn't want to develop their intellectual capacities in a serious sense. And uh, not moreover, uh, intellectual here, I, uh, I want to stress um, for even Sina is, uh, I think, trying to interpret in a philosophical way what the mystics have expressed in a mystical way as real spirituality. So, um, I have written a paper on philosophy of mysticism. Uh, so I consider that Ibn Sina has developed a kind of philosophy of mysticism. Um, that, but that's another story. Now, in another uh, of three times, and this is as well interesting, we, we have uh, the, the present, the Tukhva. Hmm. There as well, he uses this more or less the same categories using different terminology. I can not enter this. But what is in interesting here is that he links with at least three of the four categories uh, explicitly some Quranic verses. So the Quran becomes very important here. And it's not, uh, of course, you can say this, uh, this is a little bit fantastic, is, but I, I, I think uh, we must really keep in mind that there was a kind of what I've uh, labeled philosophical genre of Quranic tafsir, of Quranic exegesis. And it was one among so many other genres. So it, it's important to say it is not, I think, just rhetoric. Uh, it's much more than that. Um, then I will just have a small word about uh, a book of a somewhat later period, of the middle period uh, when uh, he was in prison, the Book of Guidance, the Diary, where he once more he very briefly presents the, the categories of different souls. But, and this is really important, at the end he, ad he adds in a very significant way, I quote, and there is for those common souls as an imagined recompense and an imagined misery, although it is not really imaginary. Now, this is maybe a little bit puzzling, uh, but uh, Michel has proposed to understand this, uh, to understand this imaginary in the Corbian sense of imaginal, what uh, Corbin has labeled imaginal. Now, this is a, to explain it in simple terms, if possible, this is a kind of imagination we transcend, the imagination we have here on earth and has to do with something celestial. And, and it's, it's really something spiritual, uh, more profound and uh, especially on the ontological level, more significant than the imagination here on earth. That for the direction, I think it's... Uh, then I can come to the major uh, work of Ibn Sina, the Ilayat of the Shifa, the Book of Healing, which is, of course, his major uh, work and well known, uh, besides his canon, of course, for, for medicine. Uh, my money, this was George and, 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 and uh, philosopher Ibn Sina was a physician and philosopher. Now, in this chapter, this is, uh, I want to first observe that the same chapter, in almost verbatim the same words, is recopied in the, or is present as well, in the Najat, in the Book of Deliverance, and uh, in the early Ma'at, in the early destination, the minor destination, more commonly known as the States of the Soul. Datation and attribution of which are still uh, open to discussion. But it is important to see that he takes the same text in, on several occasions and repeats it and, uh, with, of course, uh, now and then, very minor modifications. This, of course, needs detailed study, uh, can deal with all this. Uh, 
Some points, nevertheless, uh, think, uh, deserve special attention. First of all, even Sina stresses that bodily resurrection, once more, can only be established by the religious law, not by reason. And what that reason can establish a higher kind of resurrection, in fact, a spiritual one, what he notes that prophethood, I quote, prophethood has confirmed this, so that reason can establish spiritual resurrection. Prophethood has confirmed this. This seems to me very important. More particularly, he advises that, I quote, the metaphysical philosopher's desire for the spiritual happiness is greater than their desire for bodily happiness. Indeed, it is as though they pay no heed to bodily happiness, even if it is greeted them, granted them, sorry. So, here he suggests that the philosophers, even the philosophers, could have a kind of bodily resurrection. Of course, this affirmation is a little bit ambiguous and uh, needs further in a more in-depth analysis, but nevertheless, it is there, and uh, the affirmation is there, and we, I, I think we have to take it seriously. In so far as bodily resurrection is primarily linked with the law, it's largely with uh, moral obligations. This could give the impression that in Ibn Sina's view, the philosophical elite is not subjected to him. And as we have seen, this is not the case. Indeed, uh, one can only be really happy as philosopher in the afterlife when one has perfected both his uh, intellectual and his moral life. Uh, what he says is that, yeah, in the long run, the bad dispositions towards the, the, the body acquired by a philosopher during his lifetime will disappear gradually in the afterlife, after a period, undetermined period of time. Yeah, I am always at the conclusion. Um, and uh, so, um, let me just then uh, give my final conclusion on still uh, maybe a small word on the well, I will just give the final conclusion. Uh, the final conclusion is, in my view, that even Sina tried uh, to explain in a philosophical way both uh, bodily resurrection, which was affirmed by prophecy in all religions. He doesn't speak on, not only of Islam, although he prefers Islam, clearly. And on the other hand, uh, tries to explain in a philosophical way the spiritual resurrection, which he has found in the mysticism. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Janssens, for uh, leading us into the views of a physician and a philosopher after have, have, having got the views of a lawyer and a, a philosopher. Uh, now, the events uh, he held here in the ceremonial hall of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences is over, and after a break of about uh, 10 minutes, uh, there will be the opening of the uh, Goldsicher Memorial Exhibition, and it will start uh, in the lobby of the Palace of the Academy, then at 12.05. So five minutes later than it is written in the uh, program. And the exhibition will be opened by Istvan Monok, the Gen Di Director General of the Library and uh, Information Center of the Academy. And uh, Kinga Deveni, the cu curator of the exhibition, will lead a guided tour to the guests after the opening. If you are interested in some publications re related to the exhibition, there is a Hungarian English language small book. Okay, you can see it. Small booklet about the uh, exhibition. And now the official part is over, and after three seconds of break, I will give you some information about lunch and bus service and so on. So the information about uh, lunch, lunch starts at 12.30 p.m. Uh, for the official guests of the conference, a private seated lunch is uh, provided in the corner room of the Academy Club of the Palace of the Academy, where Professor Laszlo Kolar, the Secretary General of the Academy, will give a welcome speech. 
For the registered participants of the conference, a buffet lunch is provided in the Kodai room. Both rooms are on the first floor uh, of the building. Please go down the staircase and then turn to the right, and the corner room is ahead and then left, and the Kodai room is right and then left. But there, these uh, rooms are signposted, and there are hosts in the house, then you will find your way. Uh, and about the bus service uh, for the uh, afternoon, there will be a bus uh, to the Abichenna uh, Institute of Middle Eastern Studies in Pilis Chaba, and you can get on the bus in front of the Tokyo Budapest restaurant, which is situated uh, in the left of the entrance uh, of the academy. And you have to go, go first left and then right, and at the corner of the uh, Zrini Utsa, you will find the uh, restaurant and the bus as well. Uh, the departure time of the bus is uh, 13, okay, so 1, 1 50 p.m. And the estimated arrival time in Pilis Chaba is about an, an hour later, so the conference can be begin at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the bus can take around 40 people, but we are around 40 people. So I hope you will enjoy the day, and now first enjoy the opening of the exhibition and then the lunch. Thank you very much for your attention.